This is one of the stories from Le Mans in June of 1966, and it is also the story of a little kit car, the Mini Marcos. Recently, Seven Spot did a live stream on many base kit cars, and one of our guests was your own boy. Well, thank you for having me in the first place, because uh, you, uh, well, uh, you, Jim, you asked me to join, and um, which I liked, um, especially because it's about a subject that's near to my heart. Um, mini based cars, of course, and um, well, in particular the Stimson Scorcher now, which is yeah. uh, a most unusual design, of course, but um, a nice one. So yes, thanks. Come on, Jerome, tell them, tell them actually what you do own. Mention the man. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I have, um, um, well, about 10 years ago, I thought I'm, I'm never going to buy myself a car anymore because um, I'm fed up with, uh, I'm not, actually, I'm not a very good car owner. I like their histories and I like, um, uh, well, writing about them, basically. So I, um, I decided to, to sell all of the stuff that I had. Um, but because I'm, I'm deep into the um, mini derivatives, um oh there you go <laughs> well done quick plug quick plug <laughs> yeah yeah good <laughs> well cars do come up uh, uh they do find their way to me sometimes and it, this is because yeah. i've i've just um, been researching them for so many years so um the last 6 or 7 years two cars that, which found their way to me i just had to buy because it was the only way to find out more about them, and uh, so I did. Um, the first of them is the the actual uh, Mini Marcos that raced at Le Mans in '66, mm -hmm. yeah, which was in very much in a basket case um, condition. Yeah, so that's a restoration, a difficult one. We were we were talking. We, have you got that one? Yeah, we were talking about that the other day because that yeah, that, we were. that was the only British car, that, but it was that a French car, wasn't finished. it? Was yeah. it a French car? Well, it's a British only... car, of course. It was built up in France. Yeah, that's yeah. 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 But it was the only British mark of car that actually finished that year in, in the uh, Le Mans. And then yeah. it, it went on to do some other um, club racing and so on. But it, it ended up in Paris and then got stolen, didn't it, in 19, yeah. 1975, I think it was. And You're when... correct. Yeah, absolutely. Spot on. Yeah, it was stolen in seventy five, And what well, people have been searching for it since... Um, well, as I said, I'm, 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 I got some connections, so I, yeah. I, I've been given some tips about where it could be, and all of those tips didn't lead to anything, to any, anywhere. So um, this was back in 2016. I got another tip off, and somebody said, I know where the car is, and I thought, well, it will be another dreamer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, but I still, of course, I decided to, to take on the lead, and um, well, it's <laughs> this is a very short story now, but it was a very long, very, very long story. Uh, in the end, um, I found the car and it was in Portugal, wow. yeah, and it was the car. So, um, but the only way to find out uh, was to go there with a big bag full of money and um, <laughs> meet up in on a very dodgy place somewhere near Lisbon. Yeah. And um, I did it, and yeah. um, I took the car with me. Wow, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. There is a very interesting write-up, what he's done on uh, Jerome's blogs about this car. So if you ever yeah. get a chance, check his blog out as well. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, well, Maximum I've been writing about the, uh... it since I found it. So um, it's still going, still going, the restoration, and um, we're getting there. He's actually, cool. got it, he's actually got it bang on as well, believe it or not. He's been looking for fuel caps, what what he used. Uh, yeah, well, the life this, is and bit, everything. this is a bit of a the difficulty with the car because it's so um, unusual and so, um, well, valuable, historically speaking. Yeah, um, I thought it needs to be restored 
right. And, and yeah, in order to do that, yeah. you just need to find the right parts. But it's very difficult because they, what they used back in 1966 was the, the top of the range, high, high tech stuff. And it's very, very hard to find if you can find it at all. And it also is very expensive. So um, that took a lot of my money. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes when you want to get the whole story, you have to do a bit of digging. And in doing my digging, I found out that this story is much more than just finishing at Le Mans or finishing 15th at Le Mans. It's much more than that. It's uh, about being able to even become an entrant at Le Mans. And it's also uh, a story about how the goalposts can be changed and it's also about how victory can be snatched from your fingers as you cross the finish line. I introduced myself to Jem Marsh at the 1965 racing car show and told him I had a client in France who was interested in importing the Mini Marcos kits and that there was the possibility of a Le Mans entry. At the time, I was in business producing an aftermarket dashboard for Minis and selling a lot to Jean-Louis Marna's accessory shop, Rally Auto Sport, in Paris. Marno was racing Minis, and he admired a dash I had made for my wife's Mini Cooper to tidy up the installation of a rev counter. He placed an order for ten or so, then a further hundred and eventually thousands. Jem Marsh was keen to get a Le Mans entry, as he had not had an invitation. The Automobile Club de la West, which runs the race, was autocratic and selective about whom it allowed to compete. They also had a reputation for moving the goalposts for any foreign entry who threatened victory in the race's index of performance category with rules so Byzantine in complexity that clearly favoured underpowered French cars. They had not anticipated Colin Chapman's 750cc Climax-powered Lotus 23 in 1962 and had to resort to rewriting the interpretation of the rules, a slight from which Chapman never really recovered and swore to never go back again. So it was clear the ACO was not going to invite a British kit car manufacturer to race what was basically a reshelled Mini Cooper Special. But if the drivers were French, the car assembled in France and the entry was French, then this was a different matter. Jem agreed to allocate the distribution rights for France if a Le Mans entry was forthcoming, and we formed a limited company, Dulles Components Limited, to market the Mini Marcos on the continent. Mana confirmed that the ACO would invite them to apply for a Le Mans entry with J.C. Ballatlena as co-driver J.P. Jabouille and Troutman as reserves. Jem Marsh agreed to supply them with a lightweight shell to build up, and I delivered the shell on the back of my mini pickup. At that time, Jean-Louis Marnat was in the process of selling Rally Auto Sport, his accessory shop in Paris. There was a small workshop next door with two mechanics for fitting steering wheels, etc., and it was they who built up the Le Mans car. I was asked to supply a minivan, essentially for the paperwork and the chassis plate, because the regulations for registering a kit car in France were lengthy and complex. I bought a rather tired minivan for 50 quid and drove it over to Paris to see how they were getting on with putting the car together. We rather wished we had stayed away, as they were making heavy weather of it, and it looked like a disaster about to happen. They could not get the ride height right, and we had to tell them how much to machine off the suspension trumpets. They had no alloy wheels, as there was a wait list for mini lights, and they were experiencing cooling problems as well. I bought some spare mags for the car, and they resolved the cooling problem by fitting two radiators. What the wait must have been, I hate to think. Jean-Louis Marnat had semi-work status with the Parisian Austin importer J.P. Richard. Under his contract, he had a discount on spares and could draw two tuned engine gearbox units from BMC Abingdon's special tuning department. Marnet did not speak English, so I went on his behalf to see Stuart Turner, head of the BMC competitions department, 
and asked him whether Marnet could draw one engine for the Le Mans Marcos. BMC was not too keen to allow Marnet to draw one engine for the Le Mans Marcos, but recognized that he, Marnet, could draw two engines on the condition that the engine would not be attributable. A retirement at Le Mans could only mean poor publicity for BMC, who were on the crest of a wave and gearing up for possibly their third Monte Carlo rally victory. I also warned Stuart Turner at that time that the French were massing efforts to deny BMC a third victory at Monte Carlo. French honour was at stake, and although the Citroën team were outclassed on power to wait, they were not going let the Brits win whatever the outcome. Turner, who was a fine tactician, was rather indignant about my revelation and said that they had gone through the regulations and the homologation papers with a fine-toothed comb and had found nothing to outlaw the spec of the rally cars. Of course, this was the year of single-filament halogen lights, which switched to the fog-driving lights on dipping. The rest is history. After winning on the road, BMC were disqualified, and sadly my prediction proved correct. I delivered the special tuning engine to Paris in the back of my pickup. It was a standard rally-tuned engine in Group 2 configuration with a straight-cut close ratio box, limited slip diff, and I bought them a 2.49 to 1 drive pinion set, the highest ratio that would fit. The French assembly team just dropped the engine in and arrived for race practice with virtually no miles on the clock. The engine was a little tight at the beginning of the race, but was running much better towards the end. We were also not happy that the French assembly team had mounted wheel spacers behind the alloys and had to widen the wheel arches. I think this was done for purely commercial reasons as they sold wheel spacers, making out that wheel spacers improved road holding when they were only devised for fitting a wide rim to a standard hub. We just hoped the studs would hold for the duration of the race. The rest is already well documented. The Mini Marcos was the only British car to finish that year, and Jem Marsh hoped we would have won the motor trophy, but the ACO said the entry had to be British, so we didn't. 